Awesome, cool. Hello and welcome to C plus plus one hundred one week eight. Today I'll be here, and so will Mr. Gavin. Hello, Mr. Nelson. And so will Mr. Jason. And hello, hello. Um, okay, so today we're going to be talking about some fun stuff. We're going to be talking about inheritance, uh, kind of talking about some of the things that we can do with classes that you couldn't do previously. Like in the last class, I made it a, a point to say that we have already been doing object-oriented programming in a slightly roundabout way using structures and functions and, and how we can... Uh, use the, the syntax provided to us by the C++ language to express those concepts in a much more concise manner. However, by using that syntax, by using classes, it opens up a lot of fun stuff that we can do that was previously not necessarily impossible, but incredibly difficult. So let's go ahead and talk about some of that stuff. And again, so... It, it, Again, if people are still unsure about classes, uh, this is, uh, you can think of t this week as an extension of last week, so be sure to ask questions if you are still confused about some of the concepts that we went over last week, because pretty much everything that we went over last week is going to be a prerequisite to understanding what we're going to be doing today. All right, so Not to worry anyone at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I fault. All right, so what we have is, what we've been talking about a little bit are classes. So, um, like I said, one of the fun things we can do with classes that we couldn't do previously is the concept of inheritance. So, for example, um, you, you saw before how we had, let's say, the inventory class. And the inventory class was a nice little wrapper around the concept of a, uh, of, of a dyna dynamically um, instantiated array, dynamically sized array, uh, where we have these products. And these products, uh, the array of products expands and can, or doesn't shrink, but it expands as needed. So I'm going to go ahead and represent our product here as a class instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a product, give it a name and an ID, and then I'm going to go ahead and create accessors for the name and ID. I'm going to go ahead and create a nice little constructor, and the constructor is going to enforce that we provide it a name and an ID uh, during construction. And so, yeah, so now we have this nice little product class, and now we can represent our inventory just as we did before with a uh, uh, products array and a, um, a current count and then give it like an add product method. I'm not going to flesh out any of this bit because this is something that we've gone over previously. It's really just here for um, demonstration purposes. Um, okay. Uh, You're not calling anything in main, but... Well, I know. Somebody said something and then on the buzz I thought there was a question, but there isn't. Okay, so um, so now we have the concept of our inventory object, and we have our products too. So I can go and say like product P one, and then say uh, you know product one with an ID of one, and then product two with an ID of two, and so on. And then we can go and say say go ahead and say add inventory, add product P one, P two. Are there any questions about the syntax this far? Now's the time for them, if there is. I mean, there shouldn't be. Now, Nelson obviously gave a perfect, utterly complete and voluminous description of all of this before. I think we only have the hardcore students left, and I'm sure they're all quite comfortable with what they're looking at. Okay. So, um, so what we have is, with objects, we have the concept of, uh, of inheritance. And one of the major sort of benefits to inheritance is a concept of what's called polymorphism. I'm going to, um, uh, just as, as, as a first example of what we can do with inheritance, um, because that fits very nicely into our, um, 
into our code as it is. I'm going to go ahead and actually implement inventory in terms of a vector. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in a vector just so that we can actually have some working code. And you'll notice some interesting things about the way I'm going to put this class together. And you know, it wasn't until we were actually doing one of the earlier lessons in this class that I realized that that was push to the back as opposed to sort of push back, as in pushing back against something. Never occurred to me. Ah. <laughs> Thank you, so Paul. <laughs> Okay, so what we have here is this, uh, this inventory that has a, has a list of uh, product pointers and it pushes it back into this vector. And we have this nice little function here called display products. So our inventory is kind of this manager for, for our concept of what a product is in our, in our program. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, send in the address. Um, I'm actually going to instantiate both, or dynamically instantiate both of these products. Uh, and subsequently delete them. Um, right. Sorry, I can't think this early in the morning. Okay, so then I can go ahead and say inventory dot display all products, and then finally I'm going to go ahead and say inventory dot clear and delete p1 and delete p2. I'm going to implement the clear method as if clear, as it will just clear out the vector. Okay, so now when I run this code, we'll get this nice little um, nice little product, product one, product two, and so on. So that's kind of cool, I guess, but what we have represented here is a very limiting concept of what a product is. Um, and when I say that, I mean that the product class itself um, only does one very specific thing. And the other code that, that works on it, um, as you'll notice, I've implemented a very, uh, a very complex algorithm uh, in, the, in the inventory class that does a lot of computations uh, that we really want to be able to reuse across multiple, um, not just multiple products, but other things that are, are kind of like products. And, and uh, I'm just, you know, saying for the sake of argument, imagine if these algorithms were particularly complex. What we have here represented with our product isn't very, um, it isn't very powerful. So that brings in the concept of inheritance. The biggest point about inheritance is about being able to uh, reference something in terms of something else. And that's, uh, that's kind of what the, what the definition of polymorphism is, is in many forms, where we have this concept of a product pointer here on line 32 and uh, represented again here on line uh, 29, but we don't necessarily want to lock us down into using just products with our inventory, because we could have a variety of specialized products that have specialized behavior. So let's go ahead and talk about how we could represent that syntactically. Um, the way that you would do that is you would use the concept of what's called inheritance. And inheritance is all about um, is is all about creating a class hierarchy where one class is is intimately related with the, the parent class and so on. Um, so, for example, if I were to create a special product, what I can do in order to turn my special product into a product, but allow myself to add or alter functionality, is through this syntax. So what I have here is, is a special product. And you'll notice that I follow it by a colon and then the keyword public and then product. Um, this is called public inheritance. Uh, there is such a thing in C++ as private inheritance. We're not going to be talking about private inheritance in this class. So, and, uh, can you talk around it, explaining why the public needs to be in there? It just needs to be in there. Okay. <laughs> because if it were private, it would behave differently. 
in ways that I don't necessarily want to okay. go into at the moment. Take your word for it. Um, uh, okay, so now we have a special product. So backing out of our inventory for a second, you'll notice that if I were to create a, um, a special product object, you'll notice that um, that it has some interesting members on it already. So kind of uh, getting away from this for the moment. Um, Could you just show that uh, again? Show what? The uh, special members, interesting stuff that you said about, but that only appeared on screen for about three tenths of a second. Uh, oh, right. Do you mean this? Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, you'll notice that it has a display, get ID, and get name. I'm going to go ahead and really quickly get rid of our constructor for the moment, because that's going to be a different, uh, a different topic that we'll have to discuss in terms of inheritance. I'm going to leave it with the default constructor for now, and I'm going to give us some uh, nice little accessors. So I'm going to initialize name to product and ID to one, and then I'm going to create some set ex ex accessors. So I'm going to say void set ID int ID, ID equals ID, and then void set name string name, name equals name. Okay, so now you'll notice that P1, I can say something like set name. And I can also say p1.setID, and then I can say p1.display. Notice how I've basically inherited all of the functionality from product into this new type. So that's really the first basic sort of concept of what inheritance is. We have a fully fledged, very complex, huge uh, object or class here that, uh, that we want to repurpose for, for um, you know, whatever we need to, um, and then we can use this syntax right here to bring forward all of the functionality we previously defined into a new class. Uh, very, you know, it's sort of like a parent-child relationship. But furthermore, we can actually go ahead and inside of our uh, child class, we can add additional functionality, such as void display special, if we wanted to, which would invoke display and then say something like, I am a special product. <laughs> so this actually brings forward three interesting things. First of all, we're adding additional functionality to a derivative of an existing class. So our special product is a derivative of the product class, and we're adding additional special functionality to it. Next off, we're invoking a member within a member of this uh, derived class or of this derivative class um, that is inherited. You'll notice that that the, the the whole concept of this works in the exact same way. If I was to preface this with this, what we would get is a member listing of all of our members that we have, including display. Display is accessible as it is public, and we'll talk about accessibility in a moment. But then I'm also at, al allowed to put in my additional functionality. By doing so, I can now do p one dot display special and run this code, and we'll get what we wanted. Very special. Yes, very special. So, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, uh, is the clear method the kind of thing you would use as the destructor? No, maybe, depends. It depends on who owns the, pro the memory for product, uh, which gets into another discussion. Um, I wouldn't worry about putting clear an invocation to clear inside the destructor of inventory. That wouldn't serve really any purpose. Uh, when you instantiate a special product, does a product also get instantiated on the stack, or the heap of dynamic or the heap <laughs> if instantiated Lovely. dynamically? Um, well, kind of, sorta. 
<laughs> you can think of a special product as a wrapper around product. So uh, if I were to provide an additional field called special ID, um, not only will the fields for a product be allocated in memory, the string name and int ID, but also the additional field provided to it that, that, we, that we define or, or declare the existence of within our uh, derivative class. I think the key word in that question is also. If there's only this, there will only be the one thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A special project. A product doesn't also get instantiated, but a special product, when it is instantiated, includes the memory required to represent a product. Yeah. Okay. So how's everybody feeling so far? We, we basically, uh, again, this isn't a particularly useful scenario. I kind of jumped the gun a little bit on the, on the more useful scenarios that I wanted to talk about earlier, but this is sort of one of the most basic forms of inheritance. When we, we, you know, we have these, these awesome, useful classes and we, uh, we inherit them and, and attack on additional functionality. But th this really isn't or showcasing the true usefulness of inheritance quite yet. But how's everybody you feeling should, so far? You should throw up a, an actor class. <sighs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about some other uh, important aspects of inheritance. Let's say I have a, have a function called bled that takes in a product. And we do product dot... I don't know, do we do something with the product? doesn't matter what we do with the product. The fact is, um, if I were to go ahead and invoke that method in terms of my product or my special product, you know that we get a uh, successful compilation. Uh, that's because the, actually that's a horrible name. Um, that's because there's an implicit conversion from the child types of product to product. So the great thing about what we have here is we can reuse all of our bits of functionality uh, over and over again um, and uh, that are written in terms of product and we can use it all with our special product. So that's uh, an important consideration. Another very important consideration, let's say that my display special method, um, you know, I, I really don't want to write it in terms of the, the parent display method. I think that's kind of dumb. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to yank this implementation out and paste it here, and then I'm going to put, on, put in some nukes code. So I'm going to say uh, special ID is special ID. And um, can anybody guess what the output of this program will be? Uh, the out, or sorry, the output of this program would be. It looks like an error. Yeah, stupid IntelliSense always ruins my trick questions. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize that was what you were going for. Uh, yeah, it did, kind of. Yeah. Um, but if special product implemented its own field, you couldn't access it. Yeah, 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 I'll talk, actually that's a good point, I'll talk about it in a second. Well, yeah, it's, it doesn't work. The, the fact is, I, again, I wanted that to be a trick question, but we can't do this. And the reason we can't do this is because I was very clear in saying last week that private accessibility means that those members may only be accessed from within the type that they're declared in. That does not include children. So let's talk about a new form of accessibility because there's one more accessibility um, uh, modifier that we can use that I kind of skirted over last week and that's called protected. And protected looks like this, not surprisingly. <laughs> protected means that accessibility now is not only uh, you know, the private, as in not only can product see everything that's protected, but also derivatives of product can see it. So now it should build and... Yeah, so now it'll build and run and work and we'll get our special ID. Which wasn't initialized, but still. <laughs> that's, a, that's pretty special. No, very special. Okay, uh, so uh, NATO did actually point out something uh, in the questions panel a second ago where 
I want to make this very clear. When we use, this is a form of polymorphism, what I'm demonstrating right here. The, the function bleh takes in a product called product. And that means that anything that's implicitly convertible to a product can be passed in. Well, it, like I said, it just so happens that, that due to the C sharp specification, or C++ specification, sorry. Um, what's well, also true of C sharp anyway. But anyway, um, it, you have an implicit conversion between um, the derivative types and the derived types. So you have an implicit conversion between the children and the parent. However, that also has a consequence of when doing so, you lose access to the members that make your children special. So for example, I cannot access display special here. Um, even though you'll notice on line 76 that we're passing in a special product. Uh, this might be something that everyone's like, oh, that's so obvious, blah, blah, blah. But here's the thing. This is probably one of the most important aspects to, um, to understanding uh, object-oriented programming, uh, especially object-oriented programming in the context of a statically compiled language. C++ is statically compiled, or sorry, statically typed. Um, everything in C++ has a compile time type. Every expression has a compile time type. And that type of whatever your expression is is going to limit what you can and can't do with it. So for example, our product uh, here, which you, this is an expression, by the way, and it has a, it has a type and a value. Um, and when I mean this is expression, I mean what I'm highlighting immediately right here. Uh, this is just uh, an identifier that is accessing a parameter. It's an expression that has a has a type, a compile time type. And that compile time type is important to always keep in mind because right now it's typed to product. Because it's typed to product, at compile time, there is absolutely no way to know if the product that was passed in has any special members or doesn't. So as a result, the compiler will disallow you from doing this. And, Surprise IntelliSense and pop up on that. There it goes. Um, it will disallow you from doing this regardless of what the runtime type is. So you really have to be cognizant of the difference between what the compiler knows about statically typing your code and what during runtime what actually happens. And that's going to play into some of the fun stuff we're going to get into. Okay. Uh, does C++ have is and as? No. No. It had... <coughs> Excuse me. That was bad. That was worse. Um, it has uh, casting, uh, uh, dynamic casting, uh, which we're not going to be talking about in this video. <laughs> oh, yes, and it also has a void pointer. Um, void pointers are the are just awful things. Okay, so uh, what next? So we. I think it might. It might be a bit clearer if you made this into a specific example. Say, rename product to shape, and special product to circle, or something. Okay. Well, just a thought. <laughs> Unacceptable. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> so you too. Make it ponies if you must. No, that would be a prerequisite of a significant amount of headcanon for people to understand those examples in regards to inheritance. Um, 
I don't really get it. Why should Bled know about? Huh? I think I didn't. I say the opposite. Uh, Bled doesn't know. This is why, partly why I suggested a, a sort of relatable real-world example. Uh, what I was trying to point out here is that there was, this was a compiler error. <laughs> well, you have already been through the uh, the, C, the C sharp 101, um, but this is a very a very common thing that people get tripped up on, especially people coming from dynamic languages, because in dynamic languages you have uh, you don't really have static typing; you have dynamic typing, and and sort of the uh, the logical progression of dynamic typing is something called duck typing. Uh, which is more of a concept than an actual like written standard. But uh, typically, people who are used to dynamic languages will look at this and say, "Well, there's no reason why why you know this shouldn't work. We'll just get an error if we pass in a product that doesn't have a display special method on it." Well, that's not how it works in statically typed languages. No, this won't work in C sharp either. Again, and th this also comes from a lot of confusion people had during the C sharp uh, OOP. Well, C sharp is mostly static. There's the whole DLR thing. Uh, okay, so like, let's say we have like a shape, and a shape has uh, number of corners. I suppose. See, the biggest problem with this is the fact that I don't typically use inheritance in this way. Well, what about a uh, get area method? Actually, no, that'll play into... Um, yeah, actually, that, that's going to play into something else. So I actually want to go ahead and keep this example up for what I'm about to show next, but... Let's talk. Let's really quickly just run through this again. Uh, does anybody have any more questions about uh, what we have with special product? We're annotating the product type, providing additional functionality. Um, we can instantiate them. We can pass them into methods that expect uh, certain um, things and stuff and words. So questions. That was. Uh, you can pass them into methods that expect things that are higher up the hierarchy. Yeah. That's you, can, the word. you can pass them into methods that expect their parents or their grandparents. Yeah, sorry, there's a question that came in. But product doesn't know about special product, only special product knows about product. Yeah. Uh, we must have public after the colon operator for inheritance, or it automatically be seen as... Uh, again, I don't really want to talk about what happens when this, when this happens, basically. Um, what happens when you omit uh, when you omit the public modifier from inheritance you get private inheritance and you'll notice that although things did seem to compile um, at least as far as getting past the class definition we got a variety of spectacular failures here on lines uh, 73 and 74 because of the nature of private inheritance but again private inheritance is one of those esoteric features of C++ that um, I n never really found myself using very often, and uh, as a result, the fact that you have to annotate the most common case and don't have to annotate the edge case is kind of obnoxious, but this is something you should really just drive, you know, uh, drill into your head that you need that public modifier. Otherwise, you will get some very bizarre, difficult to sure, understand I errors. I was going to say, just take it out and, and show us the errors again. Yeah, what we'll get is... Um, Oh, actually, it has got a set of friendly. Well, it's a little bit friendly. It's saying uh, product set name is not accessible because special product used private to inherit from product. Well, you know, that's, that's C++ being friendly. Well, then we get typecast conversion from special product pointer to const product reference exists, but is inaccessible. <laughs> yeah, so friendly might be an exaggeration. <laughs> But yeah, so if you see, if you get messages like that, that, that's why. Yeah. So this is just another thing, just like the semicolon. Again, uh, it's you're you're being forced to annotate the edge case, um, or sorry, uh, annotate the most common oh, case. Suppose. But um, but it's just how it is. 
Okay, so any more questions about this? Because we're about to move on to virtualness, because virtualness is very fun. And is the. Did you decide that that's the actual word? Virtualness? Hmm. I thought we established that I can, I'm allowed to make up whatever words I wanted to. I mean, and even if we haven't, he just will. Yeah. Which is fine. Well, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Go ahead then. Okay, so. Come um, on. Faster. Uh, Tell us. Quickly. Yeah. Speak. Okay, so um, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to actually delete this bit. I'm going to keep this here. I'm going to say return zero. And then I'm going to say int, ooh, int get area, and he's going to return zero. And then, um, yeah, let's just keep it like that for now. So now we want to represent additional shapes that have a number of corners and an area for that particular shape. Um, so if we go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and create a rec rectangle. Um, uh, um, and then he's going to go ahead and so now what we want to do is we want to be able to override members. Because at the moment we don't know how to go about calculating the area of the shape. We, we have no real way of... Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can start off this implementation. I can go and say, and say int height, or sorry, int width, int height, and then I can say rectangle int width int height. And it says width equals width and height equals height. And then we can go ahead and say rectangle rect 10 by 10, which is actually more of a square, so 10 by 20. And then we can say C out rect dot get area. Now when I run this code, we get zero. Well, obviously, because the method that's getting invoked here is on line nine. Remember, we inherited everything from shape but we haven't overridden anything. The most fundamentally important under, uh, concept to understand about inheritance and the importance of inheritance within the C++ programming language is the concept of virtual, is the concept of overriding your members of the base classes, the base types. So let's talk about how we can do so. Um, the first thing we'll need to do is, is I mean, you, immediately somebody might, might suggest to do this. Immediately someone might decide, I'm going to go ahead and write the code like this, and hey, look, this works. I get 200. Hurrah. Yay. Can anybody guess the output of this program? Ooh. Yep. Remember, this jumps all the way back to the very, very fundamental, very important aspect of static compilation. And that is the C++ compiler, given that shape is a shape, and shape is a class with this function, or this member function. The C++ compiler will emit, as in produce, assembly code that will invoke whatever this statically resolves to. And this statically resolves to the method that we have defined on line 8, regardless of what we pass in. We have a. Because the own, you are? I was going to say, you, if you, you, I always think you've got to look at this from the perspective, from from the viewpoint of display shape. It's expecting a shape, and so the only thing it can rely on are things that exist in the shape. 
And so it treats whatever it gets as a shape. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't know that any other thing exists. Uh, would it work if you did display shape rectangle rectangle? Yes. If I had done rectangle instead of shape and invoked it, we would have get, gotten our overridden members. But Well, actually, these aren't overridden members. These are hidden members. Here's why. Does it warn you that you're hiding members in C++? Um, let's see. I, for some reason, I doubt it. No. <laughs> I just wondered because obviously the C sharp um, one does in Visual Studio. Yeah. Okay. So this actually gets into some really interest, a really interesting concept. The way that this is implemented is very interesting, and I do actually want to talk about it. We will be talking about the virtual function pointer table because that's a very fun thing to say, and it's a very fun thing to think about, and it's a very clever thing that people came up with. But for now, what we're going to be needing to do is expressing, wow, the only thing we need to do is to express to the C++ compiler the intent that these two methods may be overridden. We need to annotate these members with some additional compiler directives that will cause the compiler to emit code that is more intelligent than what happens on line 30. Line 30 is, is, is very dumb code. It, it just d directly uh, finds out, you know, number of corners where this function exists after it's compiled and it just invokes it. But we want some more intelligence. Because, like, for example, um, I don't have pi imported. Um, I don't know, square. There we well, go. Well, go ahead, import it. People know what importing is. I forgot which header to pi is, and I don't want to embarrass myself. Mm. Okay, so now we have a square and a rectangle, which, again, I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm kind of uh, cheating here, but whatever. Uh, the point still remains. Actually, well, the thing on. is, you only need one. You only need yeah. one. Uh, it doesn't have a width and a height. It has a side length. There we go. So now we have a square and a rectangle. The implementations of either of these classes should be fairly straightforward to anybody. Um, whoa. It's just like how to spell square. It should be fairly straightforward to anybody. I mean, I'm just saying. Okay, so I want everybody to do like a little, uh, just think about this. It's a rhetorical question, but at least think about it. Given that on line 50 and line 53, we are invoking the display shape function, given two different, completely different classes, completely different. We have rectangle and square. Rectangle and square have no relationship to each other. Uh, I mean, other, well, they're siblings, but they have no direct relationship or even knowledge that each other exists. But we're able to pass both a rectangle and a square into the same function and have it provide some bit of functionality for us because we're, we've written this function in terms of a base type. However, ask yourselves, how would display shape know to invoke the method of square, this one, or to invoke the method on rectangle, this one. So you'll notice that if I run this code, we'll get zero, zero again, blah, blah, blah. But um, display shape needs to be more intelligent. More specifically, the C++ compiler needs to be told that these methods, these methods are polymorphic, that these methods are virtual, that they need some special care taken, some additional code written uh, behind the scenes that'll provide us with this functionality. And so that's what we do with virtual. By annotating these members with virtual. Um, you what? Really? I was expecting another word at 24 and 25 and 38 and 39. Hmm? I was expecting overrides. Oh, no. You don't provide overrides. Okay. Or... Have I completely forgot a particular piece of syntax? 
No, no, I may, I'm pro you carry on, I may well just be confusing things. Oh, sexual doesn't exist. Yeah, I, I didn't think it did. Um, no, that's, sorry, carry on, I'll shut up. That's just genuinely, I thought you just made a typo then. Okay. <laughs> And this actually does um, introduce uh, uh, one quick issue, which I slightly panicked about in a second when I realized uh, something interesting about the way that this particular code works, and something that's interesting about uh, another problem. There's actually two problems. The first problem is obviously we've missed, we don't have a virtual function pointer table. Um, which, uh, of course, that's a problem. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, no, I mean how, how could we possibly think that wouldn't be a problem? And we solved doing so by using virtual. Um, that provides us with a virtual function pointer table. But I had slight, slight memory lapse as far as, uh, as, far as uh, C++'s intricacies. Uh, you'll notice that we still have a problem. We're a little bit closer, but we still have a problem. And the problem is a little bit non-obvious and will especially be ridiculously non-obvious to C-sharp developers or Java developers. Could anybody, could anybody possibly guess why the code still doesn't work even though technically it should? It's not I a could take a guess. Which... Mm. You see... I'm just waiting to see if anyone else is typing, typing, or is there anything. It's how... It's, I mean, do you have to explicitly specify? No, you don't, actually. Um, and this is funny why, this is funny how it's tripping everybody up, and it tripped me up for a, a split second. Um, basically... Do you have to call... It's, it's about... Rectangle or square dot. No, no, it's how we're passing in this object. We cast it on the way in. We're passing it by value, not by reference. Meaning that shape, the members of shape get copied into an entirely new variable. Mm. Meaning that it loses everything that makes it a rectangle or a square. Ah. Yes. So, how do we resolve it? Simple, pointers. Does everyone understand why that makes sense? At least one person said no, so you better explain. Nelson? Okay, well, first of all, you see the code's working now that I change it to use a pointer. But, I don't know, let's jump over to the whiteboard. We haven't done a whiteboard in a long time. Oh, yeah, let's. Um, Not, that's... No, I think whiteboard's probably not necessary at this point. Uh, mm, huh. Does it work on your actual computer? Is it just the one on the... No, I don't have a license for... <sighs> You're still on a demo. Yeah, um... I don't know. You've changed. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I'm going to try... This thing came with my, uh my tablet. Let me try this. Oh, this is going to be fun. Okay. And as much as I'm not used to Photoshop, I mean, I've, I've actually worked with Photoshop quite a bit. I'm not that great with it, but I'm used to the interface. Um, I don't know this interface whatsoever. Uh... And it does kind of shout consumer user interface to me. I don't know why particularly, because looking at it, I thought that and then thought, is that unfair? No. But actually, it, I think it's the big, I think they're all a bit too, hey, everybody, you can draw. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, actually, anyway, what I'm actually, I'm actually going to do is I'm going to pause the recording and do a 10-minute uh, break um, because my tablet got misconfigured over the weekend. So. Okay. Okay, so we're going to bump, and we're back. So, uh, so yeah, so now I got this um, this program up. Uh, let's see if I can actually. Uh, this is going to be fun. I haven't used this program before, so let's hope that this doesn't go bad. Um, okay, so what we have before, I'm going to jump back to the code really quickly to remind people what we're looking at. 
we're looking at a display shape function that previously took in a shape, not a shape pointer. I really want to stress this really, especially to the C sharp people and the Java, well, not the Java people, the C sharp people. Um, C++ determines whether to pass by value or pass by reference, not by anything that has to do with the type itself, but by what has to do with the parameter and what you've annotated the parameter as. By default, C++ passes by value. What does that mean? That means that things are copied. So what we have here is we have this, this display method or display function. And it took in a shape. And then inside of main, we invoke the display method, passing in a rectangle. And then we also invoked it, passing in an, a square. So let's first talk about how um, how these uh, how the rectangle and square are laid out in memory. The rectangle and square look like this. So a rectangle has the shape members, and then it has the rectangle members, which are width and height. So this is what a rectangle looks like in memory. A square looks like this. Um, no, not at all, actually. <laughs> square looks like this. As a shape, all the shape members, and then it has a width. What happens when we pass this rectangle into this parameter? Well, the shape bit in memory gets copied. Wow. Copy. Co c c copy. C c c copied. Marvelous. The shape bit gets copied into the shape parameter. Meaning nothing that made the rectangle unique is in existence in the display stack frame. So we have main stack frame, and then we have display stack frame. So main stack frame has a rectangle, and then we have display, which has a shape. So this is the stack right here. Now the rectangle gets copied into the shape, but only the shape members get copied into that shape parameter. There's no room for the others. Yeah, there's the, the, the shape, remember, remember, very, very important concept. Very important concept. When we define a function in any programming language, any statically compiled programming language, the compiler determines how large the stack frame for that function needs to be in order to exist. It needs well, to... Well, in order that it's got enough space to fit in yeah. all the things it needs to fit, and a shape needs whatever it needs. I can't remember what it needs. Uh, actually, a name and an ID. It, it, the shape doesn't have anything in it, but we're pretending that the shape does have something in it at this point. Okay. No, but the point. I mean, no, but there are things that wh yeah. wh whatever it is that a shape can have is the only that's, thing. That's that's the only thing it knows. Of. That's what I was getting at. Yep. So the the display stack frame will only be large enough to contain a shape. It will not be large enough to contain any derivatives of a shape. Meaning when things are copied into it, only the members that exist on the base type are copied into that function. As a result, this shape object is not a rectangle and is not a square, it is just a shape. The width and the height just disappear into the ether. Yep, they go away. They are no longer in existence. Do you know what also goes away? Can anybody guess what else goes away? What else no longer exists? Can anybody guess? Come on, I've said it before. 
said it before, fun stuff. Yep, the virtual function pointer table no longer exists, meaning there's no way at runtime for display to know which member needs to be invoked depending on the parameter argument that was passed into the function. And you're going to be explaining what that Yeah, yeah, we're going to be talking about the, the, the virtual function pointer table. Just, just checking. It's a magic thing, yes. Okay, how is everybody feeling about why this fails? Does everybody kind of get why this fails? The stack frame just doesn't have enough room for our class, for our objects, for our derivative types. All right, so how do we fix this? Um, oh, no. Oh, come. Oh, oh, oh. Do you break your computer and then? Oh, no, I can only have one of these. That somehow magically makes it work? I can only have one of these open at a time. Uh, oh, oh, we'll just move it, move well, to somewhere else and look, yeah. I'm just going to say, give me 3,000 by 3,000. Do it from a corner. Do it from a, do it, all right, don't. Uh, I'm going to do it from a corner. <laughs> Okay, so how do we fix this? We fix this with pointers. So by changing the display function to take in a shape pointer, we have done something very important. The display Ooh. stack frame is now going to be wide enough to contain a pointer. However, that pointer can point to anything. It can point to anything. It can point to any su sufficiently large or significant, sufficiently appropriate block of memory. So, say for a moment, rather than we were dealing with these shapes, if, if that was a... Uh, ah, well, yes, if that was a Boolean pointer, for the sake of example, is that where you get this, that you can put an int into it because it's... Well, there is actually, there, there is an implicit conversion. Why all that stuff? There is an implicit conversion between int and bools in C++. Um, so you wouldn't need to do it this way, but you could. You could theoretically point a Boolean pointer to an integer data if you wanted to. Yeah, it was more, I was, yeah. I wondered whether it would uh, do horrible things like that. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Okay, so let's talk about the main stack frame now. Uh, again, this is the main stack. We have a rectangle. And we have a square. Now, when we invoke the display function, what we can do is we can pass in a pointer to our rectangle. And we can pass in the address. Let's say this is address 0x51, and then this is address 0x72. We can pass in a pointer to this object into the shape parameter, which does not result in a copy operation. Now, here's the beautiful thing about how this works. This rectangle here is on main stack frame. But because we declared a rectangle on main stack frame, it has enough information to contain three bits of information. Width, height, and VPT, or, uh, VFPT. 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 Meaning all this bit, all these, this bit of data is contained within this rectangle and it is passed along into the display function. Same when we pass in square. The square, of course, only has a width and a VFPT. But 
again, when we pass the address of our object in, this shape is no longer just a shape. The shape is whatever we passed it, uh, passed it a pointer to of as. You get what I'm wow. saying. Wow. <laughs> you get what I'm saying. Hey. <laughs> nice. Two of, two of as is fish. Uh, does this mean we can now pass in a pointer of any derived class from shape, making the function more general purpose? Is this good practice? Yes. This means we can pass in a pointer of any derived type into the display function, and it'll know how to work with it. It'll know how to work with it for two reasons. First of all, all it needs to contain in the stack frame is a pointer, and the size of a pointer is constant and known at compilation, meaning that there you don't have to worry about the fact that you can't stuff a rectangle into a shape. You can't stuff a rectangle into a shape. A shape has a, is particular as if, you know, x bytes wide and a rectangle is x plus y wide bytes wide. And per definition, you won't be able to ever stuff a rectangle into a shape. But you can point to a rectangle via a shape. Pointer. So is everybody kind of sort of following along here? because I'm about to bring up the virtual function pointer table because that's, that's really one of the most important well, concepts that I want to talk about. Before you do, how about going back over to, Photoshop, uh, to, uh, to Visual Studio and um, just doing what you've covered there? Well, I, yeah, I've already done it, but I can, I can oh, did, actually, did I can actually? Un yeah, I can undo it. Sorry, I didn't see it happen. So now you'll notice that when we do this, what we get on line 40, or 44, this shape, is a copy of just the shape members. It's not what we want. However, by changing it to a pointer, and by passing in, or of course we'll have to change the member um, access operators, because it's now a pointer, and we'll, we'll, when, we, when we pass in, we'll have to pass in a, a, a ref, uh, the blah, 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 address of our local variables. And so now when I go ahead and hit F5, you'll notice that we get the appropriate result. Not only a few important aspects of this, of this result. First of all, get area is computed differently between a square and a rectangle. Because a square and a rectangle have fundamentally different data, has fundamentally different pieces of data. So the square only has a width, but the rectangle has a width and a height. And the get area method appropriately gets chosen between the method defined on line 30, uh, 39 and the method defined on line 25 and performs this computation on entirely different pieces of data depending on what's going on. So it's a very important aspect to understand here that not only are we passing around the concept of different amounts of data, but we're also pr passing around the concept of different functions, different methods that are being invoked, which is very cool stuff. There is one other thing uh, I wanted to point out on this because it, it, it caught me early on with these, which is, of course, if in fact it's probably clearer back on the whiteboard, sorry. But um, even though, like we said, these are now, because you're using a pointer, that, remain, that rectangle remains a rectangle, you couldn't, inside of the display method, print the height of, 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 en of anything. Uh, no, 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 not or width, yeah, exactly. Or the width, for that matter. Do you want to just yeah. say that proper? <laughs> well, you're trusting me. to whatever I just said. You're trusting me. Well, no, I kind of, I know. Well, no, uh, well fair point. <laughs> Badly said. Okay. Um, um, still, drive home the point. Can the type of something at compile time determines what members can be accessed, because at compile time shape is a shape. The parameter shape is of type shape. We may only access members from shape. We may not access anything else. So even if we define members on square and rectangle, we still can't access them. Even if they might technically exist, they don't necessarily exist. Of course, we could do some fancy, um, fancy pointer arithmetic. Don't confuse everybody. Because that is a key thing to, to just remember. I think may not. I want to try something real fast. Oh, please, Nelson, show us a magic trick. <laughs> it really did. There's so many things are um, 
Yeah, that's not going to work, right? File. Well, actually. There we go. <laughs> I got the width. Now I've got the height. Uh, well, the height is going to be uh, plus 8. Yep, width, height, width, and then garbage. Aha, see? He, Fail. Well, yeah, but... <laughs> no, 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 yeah, but actually that's garbage, see? You shouldn't be on that. Anyway. My point is, is my not, point is, is uh, actually, I actually did want to actually point this out. Um, okay. Don't okay. don't worry about the syntax that I used. What I essentially did was I said, okay, well, I know we're pointing at something. Go ahead and I... I, I Put through in some guesses as to where in memory these members might be located, and I incremented the pointers this far into memory to get them. But I wanted to point out though that we are indeed looking at a rectangle and a square. On line uh, for the first invocation, I'll, I'll remove the second invocation of display shape, so we're just looking at the rectangle. The first invocation of display shape, we are looking, I, I've just proved that we are indeed looking at a rectangle object. Now, I couldn't do this within the C++ language because of uh, the rules of static typing, but I could coax the C++ language into allowing me to move my pointer four bytes ahead, cast it into an int pointer, then dereference it. And by doing so, I've proved that what we're pointing to on line 42 is in fact the exact same object that we have on line 51. And I, yeah, and actually, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the, setting aside the horribleness of the syntax, it's actually quite simple. I mean, people should be fairly comfortable with, with what that's doing and why it works. Yep, we're reaching into the main stock frame and yanking out some of the private members of rectangle. Um, but then again, like I said, that proves that what we're doing is we're working at a rectangle. Well, because, uh, and the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but in, uh, we, we're dealing with ints for the width and height, which are for, um, oh, brain death. For the, they're four bytes wide. Yeah, that's why I have to, to get the height. That's why he's adding four and eight. Yeah. See. So anyway, definitely fun stuff. I just really wanted to drive home the point that we are indeed looking at the rectangle here online, and then and then uh, subsequently we're looking at the square. Cool. Well, that's enough of hacking 101. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you point to the rectangle with the shape, but you can still only use the things in the rectangle that are also in the shape, right? Um, mm, what you said is correct, but I, I, I want to quickly rephrase it a little bit. I'm pointing to the rectangle with the shape pointer, but the only things I can access are things in the shape. I mean, what you said was correct, I just wanted to point out, it's actually, think about it the other way around. The only thing we can access with this parameter is what's defined in the shape and nothing more. Because that's the only thing that's guaranteed to be implemented on any derivatives of shape. Okay, so now let's talk about the virtual function pointer table. Does everybody know what a pointer is? Does everyone know what a table is? Does everybody know what a function is? Does everyone know what a giraffe is? Steve, go stand over in the corner. Does everybody know who Gerald is? Gerald. Everyone should know who Gerald is. <laughs> should know what little Pip, who Little Pip is, too, by now. Anyway, um, basically, in memory, there's a table of pointers to virtual functions. Yes. Here's cool. your executable. When you, when you double click an executable, here's what happens. The operating system takes the executable with all of your executable code and loads it up into memory. It loads your executable into memory. It takes it, pulls it off the hard drive, and shoves it into memory. Now, can anybody, I, I doubt anybody will get this, but start thinking about the implications of what I just said. All of your code gets loaded into memory, which means every function
Wow. I'm just going to say funk. Wow, wow. And so on and so on. Every function gets a memory address, a physical memory address on your computer. So how's everybody feeling about this? When you're, when you're, when you're exe, when you're executable, you double click on it, it's loaded into memory. All of your functions get a, um, did I miss one? One, two, three, four, yes. five. Uh, there you go, Jason. There's me embarrassing myself again. Hooray! Okay. Well, it's even worse because you see, if I was in Photoshop, I would lasso those memory addresses over to the left, but I have no idea how to do it in this program. Okay. So every function gets an address in memory which is great. It allows us to do some really awesome stuff. It allows us to do polymorphism. Uh, is this the same principle as the string table? Are there any other pointer table uh, tables loaded into memory? Um, well, this isn't, this is not the virtual function pointer table I want to point out. What I'm showing here is not the virtual function pointer table. What I'm simply showing is, is that every function gets an address in memory. But that's all, that, that's going to lead into the virtual function pointer table, but it's not what I'm trying to express. But the fact well, is, lead on, okay, so every object that has virtual, so I'm going to go ahead and rename some of these functions because this is where stuff gets fun. Turning into stuff fun. So let's say this is get area. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, oh, this is horrible. Okay, you know what? Oh. Okay, let's try this again. You failed. In our XE, we have shape, get, we have kect, get, square, very good. I'm not, I just want to point out, get trod. I'm usually, get trod, I'm usually not this bad at a, about a handwriting, um, I'm bad, but I'm not usually this bad, I'm not used to this brush, it's kind of awkward. Okay, so I wanted to point out here, when your executable gets loaded into memory, every single function gets an address, and uh, as I pointed out in the last video, um, in the last lesson, when, when we have these member functions, these member functions really just get turned into functions, which means that because these member functions get turned into functions and functions get loaded into memory, you can conclude that member functions indeed get loaded into memory. So what I have represented here are three member functions, shape get area, rectangle get area, and square get area. Let's look down at the code to see how that happened. Line nine, shape get area. That's a function. Or while well, it's a method that gets turned into a function during compilation. Line twenty-five, rectangle get area, same thing. It's a member method that gets turned into a function during compilation. And finally, square line on line thirty-nine, we have square get area. So fun stuff. So far, so good. Fun stuff. So what happens when we instantiate a rectangle? When we instantiate a rectangle, either on the stack or the heap, we get a few fun things. We get an int width, an int height, and we also get get area pointer, and we also get the get number of uh, get number of sides pointer. But I'm not going to represent that. This is the virtual function pointer table. Which is all of it. No, this bit right here. 
the bit after the two members. See, these are the members, the fields. Those are the fields. This is the virtual function pointer table. The virtual function pointer table exists on every object instantiated that has virtual members within it. Because rectangle has a virtual member, um, and more specifically because the base type of rectangle, shape, has a virtual member called get area, every object that's instantiated of type rectangle gets a virtual function pointer table. And that virtual function pointer table will have a single pointer for every virtual function, virtual method that it inherits from or overrides. Uh, do your matching virtual functions have to take the same type of parameters or the same type of return value? Yes, it, they do. I'm not getting into the actual syntax to represent function pointers. Uh, function pointers do exist in C++, but is very much beyond scope, and they're very convoluted. So when I say get area right here, get area pointer, what I'm saying is this get area pointer represents a pointer to somewhere in memory that is invocable in the way that the signature and shape defined it as. And parenthetically, function pointers, would that be how you go about doing sort of delegate type stuff? Yes. Okay. Okay, when the rectangle is instantiated, the get area member of the virtual function pointer table points to, points to, wow, I'm sitting in the most awkward points position. To something on the left, and I'm taking bets on which one it is. Every instantiation of a rectangle will point to this bit of memory. So remember, uh, again, just to, so OX51, OX60, OX70, I don't know, it doesn't matter. The point is each one of these things have a memory address. So this, in this case, this get area pointer points to this. OX60. Okay. So every object in Sanchez as a rectangle carries around with it a bit of weight. That weight determines what function should get invoked when you invoke the function on that object. So for example, if we have a square, a square has an int height or an int width, and then it also has a get area pointer. This get area pointer points to, not surprisingly, squared up, uh, square get area, which again is OX70. Okay, um, so there's one more thing I want to point out. Um, well, there's actually quite a few more things, but one more thing I'm going to point out right now instead of later. Okay, I just defined a class called Blet. Is everybody good with this class definition? Any, de any explanation needed about this class definition? Keep it in your mind. I'm about to switch over to the whiteboard and ask everyone a question. How many sides does a blair got? Uh, zero. And it also has, always has an area of zero. Okay, so remember, we have created this class blair. So now I'm going to go ahead on my whiteboard, I'm going to instantiate a blair. A blair will only have one thing, a get area pointer. What memory address is this get area pointer going to point to? <laughs> yep. This is going to point Very to nice OX51. Area 51. I kind of like Area 51 myself. But. Okay. So now I've kind of gone over. Uh, now remember, I really want to point this out. These are instantiations, meaning if I'm created another rectangle with an int and an int and a get area. This get area would still point to the same thing, but these ints could be completely different pieces of data. Remember, these are two distinct instantiations of rectangle. Every instantiation of rectangle will carry with it a virtual function pointer table. 
Okay, so how is this used? So let's say I have a function called display. And it takes in a shape pointer called shape. And I do something like shape get area. What happens when I invoke shape dot get or shape get area? Shape pointer get area. You're full of spoilers today, aren't you, Segfault? <laughs> okay, um, this is what happens. When we say shape get area, we open up, we look at this pointer. So I'm going to say we look at the pointer. What is the pointer pointing at? Pointer's pointing at some memory. Well, there's a bit in memory that we're going to look for. We're going to look for the virtual function pointer table. The virtual po function pointer table is going to have an entry called get area. The virtual function pointer table. Virtual pointer function table. Virtual pointer table. Oh wow! I don't. I, yeah, by the end of this, I'm going to question if I can even read English. <laughs> function F pointer T table. T. So when we say get area, we open up the virtual function pointer table, we look at the get area pointer, and then we invoke this method. We jump to wherever this method is pointing at. So how's everybody feeling? This is how virtual functions are invoked in every language, I mean, it's not just, just like, It's just like the index in, a, in, a, in a, uh, an atlas, a road directory. You know, it, it, it says get area, and it looks up where get area is. Yep. And then goes there and does things. So that's why it's not only important that we don't copy our shape, that we pass it by pointer, it's also important, this is also underscores the reason why the virtual keyword is necessary. Because the virtual keyword wasn't there, the C++ compiler wouldn't even bother creating a virtual pointer function table for our members. Close enough. And finally, I get to talk about the bug that I've been, I, I've, I've pointed out this, this, this bug, this, this horrible uh, debugging session that I'll have forever ingrained into my memory. Um, and now people will have some more of a context of what happened. Uh, I, had a, I had a buffer overrun in, in, in some code that, that happened on a very rare occasion of a program I was working on. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but what it would like to do is it would like to jump into an adjacent object in memory that had no, coral, not, no logical correlation to the bit of code I was working on, it liked to jump into this adjacent object in memory and mess up one or two entries out of the virtual function pointer table. Which, if you do that, won't cause an exception until you try to invoke the method that the virtual function pointer table is pointing at, in which case you get a nice huge exception. Except for the times when it randomly points to something that works. <laughs> yeah, it never, fortunately never did. I was never that unlucky. Because <laughs> that would just be a nightmare. <laughs> so yeah, so that was that was one of the worst bugs I've ever... Ooh, scrolling uh, zooms. Um, how do I pan? No, oh, what did I just do? There I am. Pan, there we go. Okay, um, how come it knows to look at OX60 or OX71 instead of OX51. That's because every time our, our rectangle is instantiated, the virtual function pointer table gets assigned to. Every object of rectangle has a virtual function pointer table. So we have
rect one, rect two, rect three, rect four, and they all point to their virtual function pointer table. So these are all the objects in memory. And so things know, like the display function knows how, which get area to invoke by looking at that pointer, that shape pointer, opening up its virtual function pointer table, finding the entry that it wants, and then invoking that method that it points to. In fact, uh, if I'm lucky, the debugger will actually uh, actually show me. Yep. See? VFPTR. Lovely. So here's the virtual function pointer table. You'll notice it's pointing to rectangle number of corners and rectangle get area. If I were to hit F5 now, now we're looking at a square. So now we're looking at the squares implementation. All right, so how's everybody feeling about this? Because this is very important to understand so that uh, that virtual functions aren't a mystery. Because virtual functions are extremely important and are the backbone of polymorphism. And you know what? Wolf Knightley had a good idea for a little challenge you could set them to do. Okay. What do you reckon? All right. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, okay. So go ahead and um, hit the participate button if you want to participate. And? and the lack of additional participating members is, oh. Uh, sec fault, yes I did. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and reset your ready. Uh, what I want people to do is go ahead, uh, write out the shape class, write a circle class that inherits from shape. And I'll go ahead and do one quick bit of um, gifting. Um, actually, no. Oh, great. Well, that could be part of it. Go Googling, find out where the pie is and how to include it. Ooh, there we go. It's, uh, I'm just going to just show people this. Uh, it's uh, C math is, there's a M underscore pi, apparently. Oh, well, apparently. Oh, actually, I just lied. I don't know. I'll go ahead and pause the video and uh, find out where this is implemented. Um... Yeah, cool. But uh, but here's the thing. Um, yeah, go ahead and implement it, and then implement implement a polymorphic display function. Which I'll just it's a scary way of saying do what we did for rectangle and square. Yep. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video. Okay, so we're back. So basically, uh, go ahead and um, what you would do is you would write a circle and you would give it a radius. And then you would re implement the get area in terms of the formula that you use to get. <laughs> Come on now, Nelson.
There we go. Um, so yeah, so you would go ahead and implement it like this. Now you wouldn't implement the number of corners method because, well, circles typically don't have corners. Well, you would. You would return zero. Well, yeah, I'm just leaving it at the default. Definition has got one edge and zero. Yes. So now we can go ahead and use the circle by saying circle C1 uh, radius of 5 and then display shape address of C1. And we would get an error because it really doesn't like um, the fact that I actually didn't inherit from shape. Okay. So how's everybody feeling about inheritance and polymorphism? Yay, K73s. Because we're getting really close to the end of the class, actually, because there's not a whole lot we, we need to discuss at this point. We've gone over the main sort of fundamental aspects of of uh, inheritance and polymorphism um, at this point. Um, but there's a few other really interesting things. Can I, I mean, you, we know that you just, you just love inheritance. Well... And there's nothing better than inheritance, <laughs> is there? That's com that, that actually, that's complicated in terms of C++. C oh, really? C++ only has inheritance. Yeah. Okay, so in C++, actually I'm going to back up really quickly. What's a shape? Can anybody tell me what a shape is? What's the valid behavior of a shape? What does a shape, what does a shape do? What, is it, what does it contain? What data, what operations does it perform? And I don't mean what operations could it perform. I mean what operations does the shape class itself, as in if nothing else existed, just the shape, what usefulness do either of those implementations have? Now remember, we've established that it's very useful to declare them as virtual because we can reuse our functionality over and over again with a variety of implementations. But a shape itself is absolutely 100% ridiculously meaningless and pointless and it's kind of irritating me that it's possible to instantiate a shape. See, I can instantiate a shape. I can go and say shape uh, S1 display shape S1. I can do that. I don't want to do that. I hate that. That's gross. Shape does not... Make it stop. Do what? Make it stop doing that. Yep. But I want to make it clear as to why I really don't like this. I really don't like this because shape is not... Shape, shape is actually a funny thing. It's not an actual class in the sense of a class. It doesn't have any behavior or data. What it is is it's, a, it's an interface. It really is kind of an abstract idea, isn't it? Yes, it's a very abstract concept of of what things constitute a shape, and things can choose to be a shape if they want. And if they do choose to be a shape, then you can reuse your functionality between a variety of classes. So let's talk about abstract members. What's an abstract member? An abstract member is a virtual function, virtual method, with equals zero at the end of it. Somebody's getting a phone call. Yeah. It's a very interesting discussion provided by uh, Jason's iPhone, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, very stimulating. It is. Sorry about that. <laughs> Apologies. Um, okay. What have I done? What have you done? You've, 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 you've made them equal zero. <laughs> I just want to point out that I think this syntax is silly. <laughs> I really do, but it's what you use. Um, by specifying a virtual method and making it equal zero without a body, what we've done is we've made these virtual methods abstract methods or pure virtual methods. So they're purely virtual and not yep. no longer at all in any way instantiatable as just themselves. 
Well, no, do you no, not no. make? Do you not need to make nope. the class abstract? Nope. Okay, so I want to get some terminology and, st straightforward here. We've already talked about virtual. When you say equal zero, that means it's pure virtual. A synonym for that that I will be using interchangeably is called abstract. However, when you create any pure virtual methods within a class, it'll automatically make the class itself an abstract class. Uh, can you specify it nope. explicitly if you wanted to? You may not specify a class as explicitly abstract. <laughs> So now when I try to build, we also get some nice errors. Some good errors saying things that shape cannot be instanti cannot instantiate abstract class due to the following members. Number of corners is abstract, get area is abstract. You'll also notice that on line 80 we get another error. Why do you think line 80 is an error? Can anybody guess why line 80 is an error? I think I just blew something up. Okay, who can guess why line 80 is in there? Now, I haven't actually explained this explicitly yet, but think, think hard about what a circle is. Think hard about what the circle looks like. And think hard about what defines a class as abstract. Yes, Segfault, I know you know why. Quan, do we have any come on? Well I think I think I know. <laughs> but I know I think I know. Okay, so some people are, are getting some, some guesses are trickling in. Um, what's going on here is that circle is an abstract class. Why is circle an abstract class? Because we never provided an implementation for get area, or sorry, number of corners, sorry. Number of corners is a, vir is a pure virtual, is an abstract method, and we never overrode it within circle. Because we've never overrode it in circle, that means that circle has one abstract member called number of corners. And remember, if, so if a class has an abstract member, the class itself is abstract. So if I go ahead and implement number of corners, you'll notice that the error in line 81 goes away, but we still have an error in line 72, which is the error that we want. We want that to be an error because we don't want to be able to represent a shape in isolation. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that code and run it again, and we now have our proper output. That is lovely. Okay, let's bring up another a, a bit of implicit terminology here. When you have a class that is filled with abstract members, it is called an interface. To be an interface, or to be called an interface, or to be referred to as an interface by me, a class must only have methods. The methods must all be pure virtual. And it must not have any fields or any concrete methods within it. I'm not going to get into the big details about why. Oh, of course. Uh, because yeah, it gets into a large design discussion. But I will say this. Providing implementation inside of a interface class will cause you lots of misery. And it's so tempting. It's so tempting to do that. But please don't. When a class, when you decide a class should be an interface, do not put anything in it other than me methods that are pure virtual. Because of course you haven't got properties like you have in C Sharp. Yeah, you don't have properties or events. And you don't have an actual interface construct that will enforce that. I'm going to go ahead hmm. and change the naming convention of shape. Shape is no longer shape, shape is eye shape. Does that make it run on Max? Uh, as far as I'm aware, this goes cross <laughs> platform. Eye shape? Uh. 
<laughs> yes, like Segfault said, it's I, not I. You know, um, you know, Steve Jobs wanted to call the iMac the Mac Man. The iMac mm -hmm. wasn't actually his name. <laughs> the Mac Man, a horrible name. Would, would they also have had a, a Mac Woman? <laughs> um, well, I mean, remember this was early '90s, so it wouldn't be till later. Sounds like something you'd get arrested for in a park. Anyway. Okay, so, um, so yeah, okay, so what we have here is an interface, and we've called it iShape, and it's an awesome interface. Okay, so. It's truly awesome. Yes. We're getting very dangerously close to, to the end here, but I want to point out, I want to point out something interesting here. Oh, there's first time for everything. Uh, we're not talking about constant. We'll talk about constant 102 um, and references. Okay, so I have a game, I have an iGame object, and then let's say I go ahead and create a, um, and it also has a virtual void update method on it. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and I'm going to say a class engine and engine has a vector of uh, vector of i game object pointers Don't worry, case seventy three. Just the end, just the end of this class, not the end of days. Yeah, no, that's all right. Don't panic. A few months there. Okay, so now I have this engine, this engine class that allows us to go ahead and update our um, our um, game object. Yeah, uh, allows us to update all of our game objects. And let's say that we also go, want to go ahead and do something like um, uh, we want to do something like this. I want to say void render, and then I'm just going to go ahead and really quickly talk about something that's sort of almost out of scope. So now we have our engine class, and our engine class is, is a really nice uh, little game engine that has a list of game objects, and we can update all the game objects, you know, every time in the loop, but then we can also render all of our shapes. Notice the important, notice some important aspects of this. We can only add game objects to the engine, but game objects may also be shapes. How does that work? Well, that's the concept of multi-inheritance. C++ supports the concept of multi-inheritance. Now this will be s vaguely familiar to Java, PHP, and c -sharp developers who are used to having single inheritance but multi-implementation. And when I say that, I mean uh, typically in, in, in some newer languages, um, uh, multi-inheritance was, was really, it was discovered that it caused like pretty much the destruction of every developer's sanity who ever had the misfortune of accidentally trying to use that language construct for some good. Um, why? Uh, it, it, there's a variety of reasons why multi-inheritance causes massive problems and headaches. But multi-inheritance is useful when in terms of interfaces. If you, as a rule of thumb, if you are working with interfaces, 
such as I game object and I shape, it is okay to multi inherit from them as a rule of thumb. It is only ever okay, again, this is a rule of thumb, to impl inherit from a class, a single class that is not an interface. Does this tie into what you were saying earlier about don't, don't put um, uh, uh, implementation code in your interfaces? Yes. Because if you put implementation code into your interfaces, it's no longer an interface, and you'll be breaking the rule of thumb of not multi-inheriting from an interface. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and have my rectangle be an iGame object. It's a shape and an iGame object. So I'm going to go ahead and implement the update method. And there's no helpful IntelliSense nope. implement everything. No. And I'm going to implement the get ID method. I'm just going to return zero for now. The get ID is just an example of a method you might want to put on a game object as well as update. And then I'm going to have my square implement I game object. And also, this is really irritating me. This should really have been get number of corners. It's been bugging me this entire time, but for sake of clarity, I didn't want to change it, but now I'm changing it, so yes. It should be Don't get number of corners. Don't forget to change your C out text for each for square and circle. Okay, so now I have two game objects, a rectangle and a square. Both are shapes and game objects. And then maybe I have a class, um, Gerald. so out of ideas. Okay, good. Uh, that implements iGameObject. That's not how you spell Gerald. Yes, it is. <laughs> this might, be, it might well be how you spell Gerald. <laughs> okay, um, so now we have three classes that represent game objects a rectangle, a square, and a little pip. And they all implement iGameObject, but the rectangle and square also implement iShape which will give them some special functionality when used in the context of a game engine. So for example, if I jump down here and instantiate my engine, now we can say, engine, um, I'm not going to worry, okay, I want to point this out really quickly. There. In Okay, so now I've added four game objects to my engine, and you'll notice that all of this worked. I was able to add these completely different instantiations of completely different classes to this one method called add game object. And the reason I can do so is via polymorphism, because the, I, the add game object accepts a pointer to I game object. So now what I can do is I can go ahead and say uh, while true engine.update and then engine.render, and then cn.get. You know what I'm going to do also? I'm going to go ahead inside my update method on my uh, rectangle. I'm going to increase my width by one and decrease my height, height by one. And then in my, my square update method, I'm going to uh, I don't know, double my width. width. So now notice updating rectangle, updating square, updating re rectangle, updating little pip, and then you notice the uh, areas. And now notice how the areas are changing every time I update. You broke it. Yeah, I broke one of them. Okay, so um, the reason this works is via polymorphism. 
and using the proper use of interfaces. The engine contains a vector of game objects. Every time we update, we update all of our game objects. And then every time we render, we check to see if the object we're looking at is a shape. And if it is, we print out its area. Okay, let's talk about so, one more quick thing. Um, let's cool. combine inheritance with interface implementation. Because right now, as far as I am concerned, we are not using inheritance. And I will, I will be very adamant about, about this terminology because it's very important to understand the, the terminology. We're not using inheritance, we are using interface implementation. We are implementing these interfaces. Now, yes, we're forced to use the construct that happens to be called inheritance per the C++ specification, but spirit or in spirit, we're not doing actual inheritance. Okay, so let's talk about actually using inheritance to do something cool. I'm going to go ahead and, or something interesting, I guess. I'm going to go ahead and create a class called iRenderable. And iRenderable is going to have a public virtual void render because I decided that you know what I don't want to lock my engine down to just being able to render shapes now I still want to be able to render shapes but I don't want to lock my engine to just be able to render shapes so I'm going to introduce this irenderable interface and I'm going to change mm -hmm. my code on my engine so I'm back down on my engine in my render method I'm going to change my code to cast our object into a renderable yeah, it's, it does, yeah, it's game objects that you can render or could render. So now we've made our engine a little bit more generic, but we'll run into a problem because when I run this code, we don't get any rendering. Boo! But here's what I want to express: I want, I still want my shapes to only have to worry about implementing their update method and their get area methods. I want shapes to, up, uh, to implement get area and update. That's all I want them to do. I don't want to rewrite the code that would render a shape given those the, the get area method over and over and over again. So here's what I'm going to do. I shape, I'm going to turn into an abstract class. Instead of just an interface, it's now going to be an abstract class. And it's going to implement iRenderable. I'm going to delete the get number of corners method because I'm frankly quite sick of it. <laughs> and I'm going to keep the get area method virtual, but I'm going to make it protected. And then I'm going to implement virtual void render. And it's going to say, see out rendering shape with area of get area. Now this should be very cool looking for people who are following along. I'm, I'm writing this abstract class in terms of an interface, but he has a protected virtual peer virtual member, method that he's depending on on the method that implements the iRenderables render method. So very cool stuff. So now I'm going to go ahead and because this is no longer an interface, I changed it to shape instead of iShape. I'm going to have rectangle inherit from shape. I'm going to delete the get number of corners and I'm going to move the get area into a protected Now I'm going to give the same treatment to square. I'm going to move the get area into protected, and I'm going to delete get number of corners. Of course. Sorry, that completely threw me for a moment there. And uh, it's because you've, because of the way um, you have to group your uh, protect your your accessibilities. Because well, you couldn't work out why you were moving, what you were moving to where, but of course you just moved it within the same, in order to put it out to being public. Yep. So now when I run this code, we get our functionality back. But here's the difference. Hurrah! Not only do we get the exact same functionality back, we have a nice little, very extensible, or a more generalized engine that can now render anything that implements iRenderable. But we also have a convenience. Inheritance 
it, it, this is how you should look at things. Implementation is for design and architecture, and inheritance is for convenience. So we have a class up here called shape, which is a normal class. It's an abstract class, but it's a normal class. It's not an interface that satisfies the interface of iRenderable. And then it provides us a nice little convenient bit of functionality that we can reuse over and over again if we want to create a new shape. All we have to do is implement the get area method. Yeah, I don't see anybody chatting. Like, how's everyone doing? They're all ultra-focused on what you're saying, you see? Yeah, like William said, because we're watching, man. And like Bazza said, hi, Mom. <laughs> Although that was somewhat slightly less on topic. But, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say, really. It's It's all very... I was just sort of contemplating well, it, things. things. Uh, that would be, Bazakat asked why you got negative areas, and it's because you, wrap, you wrapped around to uh, your ints. Yeah. Your ints wrapped around past their max value. Okay, so Okay, so how many people were new to the concept of inheritance at the beginning of this lesson? <coughs> Are you all right, the Arminator, or did you damage yourself in any way? Did you see what he wrote? My cat made yeah. me jump and I knocked my cup of tea over my keyboard, so I missed the last 10 minutes. Okay. Do, do people have questions about what I've gone over? Just to recap, we've gone over basic inheritance, basic public inheritance, rather. We've gone over the virtual function pointer table and virtual functions. We've talked about overriding virtual members, virtual functions. We've talked about interfaces. Um, we've talked about quite a few different interesting things. And I can't remember who said it, but someone said a while, in the last class that, that our class is just a convenience for the programmer. And I wasn't, uh, uh, that wasn't uh, a completely wrong assessment from their point of view, because that's kind of how I introduced classes to this, to this course, was that, you know, this is how you do it in C if you didn't have classes. I still got people to try to think in an object-oriented way, but then said, oh, yeah, now you can use classes to make all this code a lot easier. But the amount of code required to express what this... 137 lines of code does in C++. If I were to represent this code in C, which is possible, it would be a lot longer, an incredibly lot longer, and it would be almost entirely un-understandable. Un-understandable. <laughs> Understandable. Is it necessary to pre like a hidden track? You are? <laughs> it's just a long pause. I thought we should do like a hidden track. Suddenly come in. Anyway, sorry. Is it necessary to prefix overriding members with a virtual keyword? Only if someone you... can't remember. <laughs> Only for um, if you want it to be virtual further down the hierarchy. Sec fault. Well, actually, yeah, because somebody mentioned book recommendations. Sort of, a, what would be um, for people who just can't wait until the next thrilling instalment? Where should they dig into? Private inheritance, perhaps? I mean, you know, give people some 
books or sites? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Sam's Teach Yourself C++ in 21 Days, I highly recommend. That's what got me in, not just into C++, but into programming. Um, it was a very good book. Um, and uh, things that – individual topics that – we're definitely going to be going over in the 102 class, but that people can sort of maybe look into. We're going to be talking about references, uh, which are not pointers, but they act like pointers. Uh, and they recycle some of the existing um, operators, of course. Um, we're going to be talking about constness. Uh, we will be talking a little bit about private inheritance at some point, but it's just a, such a silly concept that, that blah. Um, we're going to be talking about copy constructors, operator overloading. Um, stuff like that. Constancy. See, constantness is a... I have a love-hate relationship with C++ constantness. Constancy. Constancy. Constantness. Anywho. Anywho. There, I mean, are there any questions we've covered? Uh, are there any questions on the last eight weeks? Yeah. Because now's your chance. Ask them. I will, we will have an open office hours, but we won't answer any questions in it. We'll just talk about ponies. Yeah, I should be done with the book I'm reading right now. I can t give a good review. Uh, can we make Doom 4 with only what we've learned? Uh, actually, to be honest, as long as you... Um, well, you need to read about, uh, like, the, the you know, whatever graphics API you're using. You need to, to read the documentation on it. But, um, but like I said earlier, any program... You can express any program you want using functions, pointers, conditionals, and looping. And structures, even using classes and methods and inheritance and interfaces and implementation, will make that even a lot easier. But the fact is, you, you can express any program you want. Um, but as far as actually implementing Doom Four, um, it, that would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. Got any plans for a, uh, what people are talking about, doesn't it? DX 101? It depends. It all depends on the schedule. Yeah, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> go, um, ranting out too far until, like I said, Nelson and I are going to be spending a little bit of time talking in a little while. I was just angling for, for Nelson to, to, to cry in a corner, actually. I wasn't expecting a proper <laughs> response. Okay. Um, I don't think there's going to be homework tonight, um, but that's as far as w what you could do. Something I would highly suggest people to work on is is start uh, work on the vending machine. Get start thinking about your the problems in terms of of classes and uh, object oriented programming, and and see what you guys can come up with. Uh, I think that'd be a great exercise. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah. Sweet. Okay. And and as I had already said, uh, 102. Nelson and I are going to start getting everything all flushed out for that, and we'll get it up for you guys so that you can see what's in store and register and all that good stuff very soon. Um, also, and then hopefully we'll have a bunch of interest with 102. That's going to be kind of important. And. Yeah, that's kind of the big ones. For those of you that want to come back on Friday, we'll be here on Friday once again. Oh, yes. And uh, and also open office hours this week. Yep, yep. So, yes, there will be a 102, as I've said numerous times throughout this class. And you're welcome, the Arminator. I hope you got lots. Yeah, yeah I hope all of you guys got lots of stuff out of this. So let's go ahead and wrap it up, Nelson, and then we can get working on all the stuff that they're going to be most interested in hearing about. The sooner we can get it out, the better. Mm, cool. All righty. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Take care.